Welcome to the Alaska Weather Show. I'm meteorologist Peter Chan coming to you from the National Weather Service through a unique partnership with Alaska Public Media. It is Thursday, January 5th, 2023. And if you'd like additional weather information on top of what I provide in this broadcast, you can go to weather.gov. That is the National Weather Service's primary online presence where you can get all sorts of additional information. It'll bring you to a map of the continental US with Alaska and Hawaii to the lower left. And if you point and click anywhere on that map, it'll pull up the forecast with any relevant watches, warnings, or advisories. And, and there's much other, more information information uh, to uh, pull from here by just uh, poking around. But uh, a quick check of the map this Wednesday afternoon. The main features is what's going on in the West. We have winter weather advisories, winter storm warnings, flood watches, flood warnings, uh, high wind warnings for areas of the West, particularly centered on California. This is going to be the focus of the storm track coming up here for the next couple of weeks, at least through the middle of January, a series of Pacific storms will be rolling in off the uh, Pacific Ocean, largely bypassing Alaska. Some of the energy will try to fling back uh, toward the Northwest, but the bulk of the moisture, the atmospheric rivers, the stronger low pressures and um, upper level waves are gonna be working their way eastward uh, and through the Western portion of the continental US. Here though, we continue to have a winter weather advisory in effect uh, for some light snow and blowing snow along the Arctic coast tonight through at least noon Friday. Uh, also, an air quality alert has been extended uh, through late Friday morning for North Pole and Fairbanks, which is pretty typical this time of year when you get the low level uh, temperature inversion that sets up in that area. And then the full wolf moon of January occurs tomorrow, Friday afternoon. And overall, as the storm track, the primary Pacific storm track is gonna stay just south of Alaska and head into California, we are gonna see temperatures cool down, especially on the west side of the state, the western portion of the mainland. We'll see a cooling trend here as we go through mid-month. But a quick check of uh, some of the FAA webcams this Thursday afternoon, dead horse, light snow and blowing snow, where that winter weather advisory is in effect through noon Friday, temperature at eight above. If we go further west, even on the west side of the uh, Seward Peninsula, uh, the Bering Strait, Wales also showing snow and blowing snow and just three above. And as we drop further south, Galcana there, Copper River Basin, there's a very thin low deck of clouds you can kind of see over the airport site. Temperature nine below, that's quite a bowl where the cold air can settle in that temperature inversion setup where you get that thin low deck. Uh, and then further south and east, Ketchikan, cloudy skies, a few sprinkles as of two o'clock this afternoon, temperature around 41 degrees. And at least the southern and outer panhandle is gonna get mainly rain from uh, a few different uh, frontal uh, systems and waves of energy that uh, are in part some of that energy that's coming up from further south off the California coast as these stronger lows work their way eastward inland uh, they get some energy that kind of gets flung back up toward the northwest and that's what's going to be happening we're going to see series of uh, weaker low pressures or at least energy that are going to rotate back toward the northwest through the gulf and areas of the north pacific and across the Aleutian chain as we go through next week and into mid month. Here are the current advisories. There is a winter weather advisory in effect through noon Friday for uh, Prudhoe Bay, uh, Dead Horse through the Barter Islands and Kaktovik. And then uh, further south, uh, Fairbanks has that air quality alert along with uh, North Pole through at least uh, 11 a.m. Friday morning. Otherwise, the rest of the state, uh, no notable uh, advisories or warnings at this point, though there has been areas of blowing snow along the northwest coast and north and west sides there of the Seward Peninsula. And I just want to pass along a neat photo I saw a couple days ago. We had a coronal mass ejection strike the earth and trigger a minor geomagnetic storm on Tuesday night. If our skies would have been clear, and I'm sure some people did north of Anchorage uh, were able to see the northern lights, uh, they were active for a time. Uh, this image was taken by a pilot, uh, Matt Melnick, uh, from when he was flying 30,000 feet over Alberta, Canada. And you can see the 
the uh, lights below as well as kind of the uh, uh, glow to the snow cover snowpack on the ground because the moon uh, was three days or so before full phase. So that's a waxing gibbous moon illuminating that snow cover and the terrain. So a really beautiful photo. Always wanted to see the northern lights from way up in a, a commercial aircraft at 30,000 feet. Well, looking at the satellite imagery, there are all sorts of smaller waves of energy embedded in this image. Uh, we have the ones that are pulling up uh, from southeast to northwest along Haida Gwaii and uh, the uh, Panhandle coastline. We also have them south of ADAC in the North Pacific pulling back toward uh, the Western Aleutians and the lower Bering Sea. There's also a weak low pressure near the Yukon Delta that, and, and a trough extending northward up into the Chukchi Sea coast. It's keeping those breezy conditions there along the northwest coast and north and west side of the Seward Peninsula. And as I put the satellite loop into motion again, you can see that uh, moisture and energy lifting up uh, from uh, southeast to northwest across much of the screen. So on today's weather map, uh, there is an area of low pressure there to the west-southwest of uh, Vancouver, down there in the northeastern Pacific, well south and southeast of the Gulf, another little system uh, well, well south of Kodiak Island in the North Pacific, and then a few lows that sit back toward the uh, central and western Aleutians with a weak low uh, just along there the Yukon Delta with a trough extending northward. And as we go through tonight, that trough persists along the Chukchi Sea coast and through the Seward Peninsula and western Norton Sound. We continue to have a couple of lows lagging back there toward the Aleutians and then a few lows that are uh, from the northeast Pacific up into the Gulf, the one that's uh, off uh, just off there of uh, Kodiak Island rather weak. And for Friday, continue to see a weak low up there the west side of the state. Uh, the next more substantial low in the North Pacific is well southeast of the Gulf uh, and another couple areas of low pressure there near and south of the central Aleutians. And then as we go through Saturday, uh, we see another system that will be pulling back across the Panhandle, bringing more rain to inner and outer channels with some snow there in through the inner coastal mountains. And there will be a better push of moisture heading up toward the eastern Kenai, Prince William Sound, east side of Kodiak uh, later on this weekend with that system. Temperatures overnight generally above freezing southern parts of the Panhandle, below freezing in the north, Juneau on up through Skagway. Ten below there at Gulcana, uh, Glen Allen areas, uh, single digits in uh, uh, Anchorage Bowl, and then temperatures Friday afternoon should get back up in the 40s there uh, along, uh, say, Metlakatla, uh, westward through Craig and Sitka. Temperatures above freezing, 36 at Kodiak, uh, but below freezing along at least uh, the, the Kenai, even the Kenai coast there at Seward and Homer. And Saturday morning lows uh, a bit milder there in the southeast, generally above freezing except for the far north where there could be some accumulating snow around Haines or uh, Skagway and White Pass for sure. And then back further west, uh, sub-zero temperatures, Copper River Basin, other side of the Alaska Range at McGrath. And for Saturday afternoon, temperatures uh, in the 40s there across uh, the outer areas of the Panhandle. Uh, temperature may get up to just above freezing there at Seward and um, still reaching, trying to climb back up through the teens there, say in uh, Anchorage Bowl up through the lower Matsu Valley. Temperatures across the uh, interior will be at or below zero in many places, especially along the Yukon River this uh, Thursday morning. Fort Yukon had the state load right around 18 below zero, probably be close to that. It depends just on the degree of clearing. But you can see at least not terribly cold for this time of year. Daytime high, single digits above and below zero in the far north and central east central areas of mainland back toward the west coast some single digits but even lower teens at Nome and uh, Imanok and then Saturday morning lows could be a bit colder there and through the east central areas 15 to 20 below around Fort Yukon and certainly north slope and along the Arctic coast daytime highs on Saturday again generally single digits above zero in most areas and again around Norton Sound lower mid teens Friday morning lows single digits some below zero the interior of the Kuskokwim as you go up the Kuskokwim Basin. Generally, you have to get back out into the Aleutians to see temperatures around or a bit above freezing. Friday afternoon highs uh, are not above freezing unless you're Kodiak Island southwestward. Otherwise, highs generally in the teens, 14 at Bethel, Landvik, um, and then for Saturday morning lows, again, some areas of the west side.
side of the Alaska range will be well below zero, at least 10 below. And readings generally above freezing uh, across uh, the eastern Aleutians with Saturday afternoon highs perhaps getting back up to near 40 around Dutch Harbor, but staying in the teens across much of the southwest interior. Let's quick check six to 10 day temperature outlook as the parade train of storms stays south of Alaska, aiming right toward California. It's going to cause uh, the temperatures to cool along the west side of the state around Norton Sound, Seward Peninsula, Lower Yukon Basin, especially there around Nome and Bethel. Meanwhile, it'll help warm the southeast a bit. And even going uh, in through mid-month, January 13th through the 19th, we see that accentuated and continue west half of the state, especially the far west, with temperatures averaging below normal, near normal temperatures for the east and the panhandle through mid-month. Precipitation will average a bit below normal there, uh, with more of a north-northeast flow along the west side of the, of the state, with maybe a little above normal in the southeast interior surrounding Prince William Sound and along the Alcan border. And here's this, this tells the story. Look at the shot of above normal precipitation coming into the western continental U.S. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. Well, let's now check out your aviation weather. If you have a flight planned Friday or on Saturday, Low pressures, there's gonna be a series of low pressures kind of pinwheel back toward the northwest from the northeastern uh, North Pacific up into the Gulf. And then also similarly, we're gonna have lows out of the North Pacific kind of pinwheeling back across the central western Aleutians up into the lower Bering Sea. These storms are not gonna be especially strong, but they will keep some unsettled going along areas of the Gulf Coast and Panhandle, especially Friday. And then the interior areas Friday morning, widespread IFR conditions throughout the southwest, southwest coast, down up through Norton Sound, uh, Seward Peninsula, St. Lawrence, some pockets of IFR, especially the Eastern Brooks Range uh, down toward uh, the upper uh, Yukon Valley and upper Tanana Valleys. And then for Friday afternoon, rather widespread IFR conditions anticipated across much of the Panhandle, areas of East Central along the Alcan border, and then much of the West uh, from areas of the Brooks Range and North Slope all the way down uh, to Bristol Bay. And for Saturday morning, uh, IFR conditions should uh, abate a bit through the panhandle, still holding on in the far north. And then a broad area of IFR conditions north of the Alaska Range, all along the Yukon Valley, on up uh, through the Brooks Range and the west and southwest side of the state. And uh, IFR conditions for Saturday afternoon will persist along the central Yukon Valley, up through the Brooks Range, Seward Peninsula, North Slope, and especially eastern Arctic coast. And a Tuvik Pass on Friday, should generally see MVFR conditions, as will Attigan Pass. And then further south and west, Lake Clark and Merrill, generally MVFR conditions. You can actually see some VFR conditions there on the east side uh, toward Cook Inlet for Friday afternoon. And for Friday, rainy pass, generally MVFR conditions. Windy pass may see VFR conditions early Friday give way to MVFR conditions. Same thing, Isabel Pass, uh, VFR conditions early Friday giving way to MVFR conditions. And further east, Mentasta Pass should generally be surrounded and uh, stuck there in uh, MVFR conditions. Further south and west though, Tanita Pass is looking VFR as well as Portage Pass. And then in the far northern panhandle and actually much of the panhandle on Friday should see IFR conditions, particularly there, the north end at Chilkoot and White Passes. And freezing levels are highest in the southeast. Uh, they bump up uh, to two and 4,000 feet aloft over especially the central southern panhandle with the surface freezing line running along the inner channels of the southeast, the northern Gulf Coast, along the eastern Kenai, Kodiak Island, across the Alaska Peninsula into the central Bering Sea. Greatest threat for icing on Friday will be with an area of precipitation, deeper cloud cover, above generally above 6,000 feet over the panhandle and even above 8,000 feet near and south of Haida Gwaii. Further west, above 3,000 feet uh, along and just north of the central Central Aleutians and then generally above a thousand feet around St. Lawrence, the Bering Strait and areas of the southwest interior, including the lower portion of the Yukon Valley. Jet stream upper level winds are not particularly strong. Uh, we have uh, high pressure circulation uh, there over British Columbia coast uh, and around that uh, we're looking at uh, south southwest winds across the Gulf anywhere from about 65 upwards to 80 knots and then another area 
further west of uh, south uh, flow across uh, over the central, uh, between the central eastern Aleutians, upwards of 45 to 60 knots at 9,000 feet or 700 millibars. We find a couple of weak low circulations near the Kenai coast and then just, just south of the Alaska Peninsula uh, with a little stronger low circulation in the mid-levels back toward the western Aleutians where we do have some winds of 45 to 55 knots there from the south coming up across uh, at least uh, the eastern half of the Aleutians and at 3,000 feet. Strongest winds are down along uh, the British Columbia coast off of Vancouver, 45 to 65 knots associated with low pressure circulation that down in the northeastern portion of the Pacific uh, offshore of the continental Pacific Northwest. And then back toward the western Aleutians, a low circulation with some stronger wind flow, 3,000 feet, 45 to 55 knots across uh, parts of the eastern and north of the central Aleutians into the lower Bering Sea. The greatest turbulence will be out there across the central uh, into the eastern Aleutians with perhaps some isolated severe turbulence surface to 4,000 feet, especially there uh, as you get uh, west of Nikolsky and uh, back toward ADAC, and then also some moderate turbulence possible along areas of the southern uh, half of the uh, panhandle down at Haida Gwaii from surface to 6,000 feet. Happy New Year, Midnight Maniacs. Trace here. Let's watch Boote's rise while we talk 2023 stargazing. Hit the darkness after 3 a.m. and look east. You should see the second brightest star in the sky, Arcturus, part of Boote's the Herdsman. He's sort of a sideways V-shape. Got him? Great. This year, we've got a very close conjunction and some great meteor showers coming up, but the most exciting thing happens October 14th, 2023, as an annular solar eclipse hits the Americas. Annular means the moon won't completely block out the sun, but for several states west of the Mississippi, parts of Central and South America, y'all are gonna get an amazing ring of fire, and everyone in this hemisphere will get a partial show. But back to Boötes. His body is an asterism called the kite, or the ice cream cone, which actually <laughs> makes me want ice cream too. I'm Trace Dominguez. Thanks for watching Stargazers this year, and keep looking up. also known as the white whale, lives in large groups and are unusual among whales. They have no dorsal fin, large bulbous heads, and they can actually swim backwards. To feed, they produce sound to find and hunt fish and invertebrates, and they use sound to communicate. They're also known as the canaries of the sea because they make such a diversity of noises. They make chirps and whistles and gurgles and trumpeting sounds. They just make all kinds of sounds. In the U.S., beluga whales live in the cold waters of Alaska, and there are five separate populations. Of those five, the Cook Inlet population is the smallest, and it's declined by about 75%. Subsistence hunting may have contributed to this initial population drop, but this practice was regulated starting in 1999, with the last hunt in 2005. Still, the beluga population here has yet to recover. We listed Cook and the beluga whales as an endangered species under the Endangered Species Act in 2008, and we had hoped that the population would start recovering, but we are still seeing a continued decline. And these beluga whales are only found in Cook Inlet, and so if they go extinct, we don't think any other belugas will come back and populate this area. These whales spend most of their summer near Anchorage, Alaska's largest city, where threats to belugas are on the rise as the city grows. These may include diminishing food, habitat loss or destruction, pollution, toxins, and human-caused noise, which hampers their ability to feed and communicate. Researchers are trying to understand which of these threats may be impacting them most, but Cook Inlet is a tough place to work. It's really hostile for research. We have the strong tides, which makes it challenging for human safety, and we can't see through the water. It is very muddy, so we're pretty much limited to the part of the animal that breaks the surface of the water. And as a result, we have limited information about the specific population dynamics of Cook and the Beluga whales. Up until recently, 
Information has mainly come from annual aerial surveys from aircraft and boat or shore-based photo identification surveys that use unique markings to tell animals apart. Scientists also use passive acoustics to listen for belugas, but none of these methods can detect much information about their health. So it's really been a game changer with, with the whole species in the spotlight designation. We've gotten more resources within our agency. For instance, we're able to use a drone to collect some aerial imagery of belugas in the wild, and we're hoping to learn some information about the age classes, information about the health status. And probably the most important bit of information that we'll get out of that is we'll be able to identify the new calves. And we're hoping if we keep doing this every year, we'll be able to get an estimate of calf production every year that will tell us something about how well the population is doing. We are also expanding upon our biopsy studies, hopefully to give us some information about sex, the individual's reproductive status, some genetic information, uh, some contaminant loads. Public and private partners are contributing as well. Some are looking at toxin levels in the whale's prey, while others are analyzing beluga teeth to learn about their age and past diet. Others monitor water quality and how belugas react to boats, and more check to see if their behavior changes with increased background noise. All of these findings will go toward developing effective recovery strategies for this population. As for what you can do, if you're out boating, give beluga space. Don't drive right up next to them. Stay about 100 yards away. If you're flying over them, just remember that you're putting noise into the water as well, and so stay at least 1,500 feet above them. Report a stranded beluga whale as soon as possible, and that's if they're dead stranded or live stranded. The amount of information that we can learn from these animals by responding to a stranding is monumental, and it will help our efforts to recover them. Together we can help beluga whales thrive in the dynamic waters of Cook Inlet. With continued research and good stewardship, we hope to see this population grow in the years to come. And now, marine weather around Alaska. Well, let's take a look now at your marine weather. We start with the sea ice. Extensive sea ice is occurring across uh, the far north Arctic coast down through the Chukchi Sea coastline and through the Bering Strait and in around Norton Sound and St. Lawrence Island. Of note, we did see some plinias open up west of Utkiadvik. We're getting a pretty strong easterly uh, flow there along the Arctic coast, upwards to 30 knots, which is causing uh, blowing and drifting snow and also would cause the ice to shift around a bit there. So be aware of that especially along the northern Arctic coast here as we go through the day uh, on Friday, but it should come down a bit here by Saturday. Further south, the ice continues to expand west and southward and should be able to get to the vicinity of St. Matthew at some point by early next week. Uh, the ice uh, kind of redeveloping there further south down around areas of Bristol Bay and up in through Cook Inlet. Uh, we expect temperatures uh, to not be uh, much above or below normal, near normal in these uh, southern extents of the state, uh, at least here through the weekend, early next week. And for the inner channels of the Panhandle, winds will have uh, a north-northeast component, Petersburg northward 25 to 30 knots, waves running around five feet, but southeast gales to 35 knots, Ketchikan, Metlakatla, especially there at the entrance of, of um, Dixon entrance, 11 foot waves. Outer coast, we are gonna see wind strengthen right now, east to southeast on Friday, 25 to 35 knots there south of Craig with waves uh, 11 to 16, 17 feet, but by Saturday, we'll see this gale force frontal system working its way along uh, the panhandle, creating southeasterly winds 35, 30, 35 knots, gust upwards of 45 knots. Petersburg waves five to as nine as uh, high as nine feet there around Dixon entrance. Northwest winds to 30 knots with six foot waves, uh, inner channels of Lynn Canal. And then uh, outer coast, uh, 40 to 45 knots southeast gales south of Gustavus off of uh, Sitka and Craig with waves. Uh, uh, they're 19 to near 20 feet. For the northwestern gulf, winds on Friday will be out of the northwest, 15 to 20 knots, uh, waves three feet in Prince William Sound, six, seven feet off the Kenai coast, and look for uh, north, northwest winds lower half of Cook Inlet to 15 knots, waves three feet. On Saturday, winds do pick up, 
a bit uh, out of the northeast along the Kenai coast to 25 knots, uh, turning northerly to 30 knots uh, through uh, the entrance of Cook Inlet and just northeast of Kodiak Island where waves will be running as high as 9 to 13 feet. Upper portion of Cook Inlet and Prince William Sound look for northeast to north winds 10 to 15 knots with waves running 2 to 3 feet. On Friday, uh, winds in Shelikoff Strait 10 knots, variable 2 foot waves. Uh, winds will be a little bit of a mixed bag there off of the uh, Pacific side of the Alaska Peninsula. But on the Bering side, northeasterly 15 to 20 knots, waves 3 4 feet. And for Saturday, winds pick up around uh, Kodiak Island and uh, east of Chignik, uh, north winds uh, 30 to 35 knots waves, 7 feet Shalikov Strait, 10 to 13 feet on the North Pacific side, and northeast winds 15 knots waves 2 to 4 feet from Bristol Bay down to north of Cold Bay. 45 knot uh, gales from the southeast uh, to east there across the central Aleutians for Friday uh, with waves uh, running anywhere from 9 feet south of Unalaska to 20 feet there south of uh, Atka on the North Pacific side. and. Uh, Generally 12 to 14 feet there west of Nikolsky uh, for Friday on the Bering side. And then on Saturday, still uh, 35 to as high as 45 knot uh, gales through the central and eastern Aleutians. Waves as high as 18 to 20 feet on the North Pacific side and as much as 11 to 16 feet, especially between Atka and Nikolsky. And along the southwest coast, ice is in place. Winds uh, will be northeast to east, 15 knots or so over the ice areas, but uh, easterly 30 knot winds with eight foot waves around St. Paul, St. George. And for Saturday, east winds 10 knots out of Norton Sound with the ice in place, uh, otherwise north northeast winds, 15 knots over the ice, but increasing to 35 knot easterly gales in the vicinity of St. Matthew with waves as high as 14 feet. Along the Arctic coast, 30 knot east winds with ice, turning northeasterly through the Bering Strait at 15 knots. And then on Saturday, those winds come down to 20 knots along the northwest and Arctic coast with ice in place, turning to the north, passing through the Bering Strait at 15 knots. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating.